this canon is one of my favorite songs. And, and I didn't even know that the guy that's, that's going to, I'm going to be interviewing today was a piano player. But I did know that he could tell me what happened on this date because every day on these radio stations, W.B. Ward comes on and he tells us what took place. And today he's here with me. Are you there? Well, hey, if you keep practicing, just maybe. <laughs> no. Well, I'll tell you, that's one of my favorite pieces. Uh, th- these people here know that there's no stranger to that canon. Now, is it called canon in D? I, you know, that's a good question. I know it's referred to as canon in D. Sometimes in classical music there will be some kind of a real fancy title, like, for instance, I know Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata is actually called Sonata in C-sharp minor. And I don't know if Paco Bell had, had actually an official title for that or not, but Canon and D is the only title I've ever seen. Well, do you know the history on that song? Um, no. Well, now, as I've read it from some place, I think uh, Wood Song's Old Time Radio Hour, uh, they, they had it, I heard it on the radio. He said that this guy, uh, a century or so, wrote it, and he wrote it for a wedding. And then they just kind of uh, stuffed it away, and it wasn't played for a century, maybe even two centuries. You're going to have to look into that, W.B. Ward. You know, now that, now that you're saying that, that does ring, ring a bell. I, I, think that, I think that is correct. Um, that, of course, was from, um, gosh, I, I, I don't recall right offhand. I know that's off of one of my CDs that I've recorded. Um, but that's my particular arrangement. And if you ever hear that all the way, all the way through and listen very, very closely, uh, you can hear where I snuck in uh, Jolly Old St. Nicholas into, into the melody uh, of that. And I love uh, Canon and D because if any, for anybody who ever takes uh, uh, basic music theory and you learn about chords, uh, majors, uh, minors, and relative minors, then you learn very quickly that this particular song is an excellent, excellent uh, e- example in, uh, in music theory. In fact, that th- this song, to this song, you can sing... Um, uh, Jolly Old St. Nicholas. You can also sing Puff the Magic Dragon and also the song One Tin Soldier uh, fits the chord progression on this beautifully and you can sing any one of those uh, w- with this all the way through. But there's only seven or eight notes in that whole song, isn't there? That's about it. The, the whole thing features around, uh, let's see, um, C, A minor, D, 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 D. Well, okay, it, it focuses around what's called a three chord progression. Every major chord has a relative minor, so it features that chord and its relative minor for a total of six chords. So basically, it just simply goes down the scale, which will, it would encompass, uh, uh, would uh, include about seven notes, yeah. This is W.B. Ward. You listen to W.B. Ward twice daily on every, whatever station you're listening to here because we usually, around a quarter to seven every morning, you hear him come on, and he tells you what, happened that day. W.B. Ward, welcome. I haven't got to talk to you personally, but for years we have had this program on, and it is an excellent program. Well, thank you. I, I really get a big kick out of producing this. Where do you live? Where are you from? I am in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is my hometown. I was born here. I was raised here. I've lived all over the country. I've lived as far west as San Francisco, as far east as Washington, D.C., and uh, I lived I lived out of the country. I lived in Mexico for a couple of years, but I always come back home. Well, what what did uh, what what your dad and mom do there? What do they do uh, for for a living? Well, my my dad um, throughout uh, throughout my life he had several he had several jobs. We kind of grew up in a. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm one of these guys that has one of these uh, uh, stories. You know, we we were so poor. You know, we couldn't afford anything. In fact, when I was a child. Um, we lived uh, near downtown Tulsa, and my brother and I, for like seven or eight years, something like this, every day our morning ritual was walking from our home to a nearby laundromat, and we'd have uh, two plastic jugs, one in each hand, and our chore was to go down there and fill each jug up with water, and that would be our water supply for the day because we had absolutely no utilities for like about eight years or so. Now, of course, we were young. Honestly, we did not know. We we did not know we were poor. Um, we just figured everybody was you know lived that way. So you know actually it was not a one of those 
uh, childhoods where you stop and think about it and you shed a little tear and you think, oh, that poor child. But just remember, you know, from our perspective, you know, we were just living a normal life and we were getting by. So my father had every kind of job you could imagine. He, uh, he was everything from a, an insurance salesman to a truck driver. At one time he worked for a major gas company and he drove a cab. Um, he had a private investigator license. He, he did some investigating and stuff like that. So he was kind of a jack of all trades. He passed away back in 2001. And uh, my mom, um, God love her, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, she is the first, the one and only love of my life. She's a wonderful lady. She is, I'm fortunate to say that she's still with me. Um, uh, she, uh, she's now retired. She worked for the, uh, the greatest majority of her life working with children. How about brothers and sisters? I have two brothers. I have an older brother, uh, Tom. He's older uh, 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 than me by about three years. Um, he is uh, he is currently living on disability. My uh, younger brother Tim, who uh, is more like a son to me than he is a brother, because there's like 12 years difference between the two of us, and he works currently for a major uh, satellite corporation that uh, delivers uh, satellite programming. Well, now as you grew up, did you attend college? No, uh, actually, I dropped out of high school. Um, I was a high, high school dropout for years, and. Then much, much, much later on, I mean much later on down the road, uh, I went ahead and I got an associate's degree in journalism. Um, but I was like, oh, gosh, in my 30s by the time I got that. Most recently, uh, I did take some courses from Princeton University in sociology. But as far as a formal education, you know, back when I was a youngster, I'm sorry, that just, that just never happened. I, I, never, I never made it out of high school. Well, join the club. <laughs> what, what about have you ever been married? Do you have children? Oh yes, I, I have. Uh, uh, I have two absolutely wonderful kids. Uh, my daughter April, who lives in uh, in Arkansas, she she has given me a, a, just this beautiful, charming young man as a, as a grandson uh, by the name of Donovan. Donovan is now, I believe, uh, eight years old. Uh, just a just an absolute crispy young man. He, I mean, he could he could bring a smile to anybody. My son Jim, who lives uh, in the state of Washington has given me two uh, two grandchildren, um, uh, Donovan and, uh, excuse me, uh, when you know it, I'm going to get their names mixed up. Gavin and Chase are my grandsons by my son, uh, ages 9 and 13, respectively. Uh, my son is an active uh, uh, member of the United States Army, has been for a number of years, and I'm just as proud as can, as proud as can be of them. Did you get my email when I said I'm going to give you a date? I did indeed. All right, now, folks, for those of you that may think this voice sounds familiar we're going to pick a date and he is going to take off and tell you what happened and then you're going to know exactly who this is the date is september the 1st 1950 1953 september the 1st 1953 was the uh, birthday of a very famous radio personality he has heard uh, by thousands of people every every morning he has the charm of, of of a petunia and he can have the roughness of a piece of sandpaper he's a young man by the name of steve peters uh whom all of you know and love <laughs> so you heard it there folks and he gives us information about everybody on their date uh or this happened this day so many interesting things and so many things that I learned. You know, I download a lot of stuff and I don't listen to it. Yours, I download where I can listen to it every day. Bless your heart. And you know, and you know Steve, the, the one thing that's really great about your birthday, and this, I, I was reviewing this and I thought, well, I'll be darned. I didn't realize that. But uh, September 1st had a lot of great things happen on it, but there was only one thing that is worthy of mention within the Almanac for 1953, and that is indeed your birthday. Absolutely <laughs> nothing else has made it into the Almanac on September 1st in the year 1953. Well, what else made it in there in the other years? Well, let's see. In 1878, a young lady by the name of, and I love this, this has got to be one of the greatest names in history, Emma Nutt, that's spelled, <laughs> I love that, N-U-T-T, -T, Emma Nutt. She became the very first female telephone operator and uh, up, up until then, that job was held by, by men and men only, and she was recruited to that job by uh, the one and only Alexander Graham Bell, and she went to work for the Boston Telephone Dispatch Company. And her sister, Sheila Nutt, came in as, as, a, as a close second place to that. So the idea, of, for those of us in our age and, and a little older who can remember back when we actually had to use telephone operators, the first female operators were a pair of nuts. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, the movie, if, for those of you who are really science fiction fans, I love science fiction myself. I'm, I'm a Star person. Trekker myself. Well, you'll be happy to know that on that date was the very, very first uh, science fiction movie to ever be released. It was released in France. It was a movie called A Trip to the Moon. And for those of you with Internet access, you can actually watch that entire movie on, on YouTube. It's a very short movie, but it is kind of neat to uh, uh, kind of neat to watch. Um, of course, like any other date in history, you know, it has its share of the dark side as well. In 1939, uh, on September 1st, Adolf Hitler signed an order to begin the systematic destruction and uh, killings of people who uh, were mentally ill and disabled people as he was trying to uh, uh, purify the, the German race. And being part German myself, I, I look at that with a, with a great deal of angst, but that is, that is uh, a, a part of the history. Also in 1945, on that same date, that's the date that the uh, United, United States received the official word of Japan's... Well, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is kind of good. This is good news. The United States received the official word of Japan's formal surrender, which brought an end to World War II. Now, in Japan, that was actually on September 2nd. It didn't happen there until the next day, but the United States received word on it. Well, so it was exciting on September the 1st. Absolutely. A lot of great a lot of great things, both uh, both positive and negative. Uh, Jerry Lewis topped out uh, his his uh, fundraising capability on the uh, uh, for the muscular dystrophy telethon in 1986 on September 1st. He raised raised a record 34 million dollars uh, during his annual telethon over the Labor Day weekend. I remember watching that because, as I recall, when he, when he hit the million dollar mark, that was the first time that they had ever done that, and their tote board only held six digits. And he actually ran backstage. Or somebody brought one on, I forget which, but somehow or another he wound up with a bucket of paint and a paintbrush, and he painted a great big one, and then as the, as the night progressed, he would scratch that out and, and change that to a two, and then later on in the morning, uh, he had $34 million up there on the board. Wow. Well, you, you've got an exciting life where you can set and find, I'm not going to call it trivia, I'm going to call a lot of it history. Some of it's trivia, but a lot of history goes through your mind and fingers, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And, you know, you bring up an interesting point of what is the difference between trivia and what is the difference of, uh, between trivia and history. Um, actually, I find it more important to know, um, uh, to, to know the little tiny things in, in, that happen within our history. Like, for instance, Emma Nutt becoming the first female telephone operator. You have, to, you have to admit that, at best, that's going to be just a footnote on some page of some history book. In my book, it's actually listed as a featured event. Uh, because the way I look at it, when you, when you look at things like uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, of course, the attack on 9-11, uh, the, uh, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, uh, when Columbus sailed the oceans blue in 1492, all of those dates, yes, those are, those are of great importance, and they mean a lot, and they should be taught in our schools. They should be in the textbooks. But those are the giant boulders that happened during our history. But if it weren't for those, gi- but if it weren't for those little tiny grains of sand that that line the beach, those giant boulders would never exist. So I believe that those little tiny things that you and I refer to as trivia, and sometimes we all do it kind of lightly and almost flippantly, those little tiny things we call trivia are actually, to me, hold a lot more importance many times than the actual big boulders themselves. Well, you've had. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down. That was good. <laughs> yes, make a song out of it. <laughs> now. This is a a deep question. You're going to have to give some thought to this one. Okay. What do you think is the most significant happening that has ever okay. taken place in man can, man mankind? No, no I, actually, I don't. I don't require any thought of that at all. I know exactly where my opinion goes. The biggest thing that has ever happened, in my opinion, in my opinion, the most important day in history. That's not of a personal nature, you know, like when I, my son was born as my first child or anything like that. Um, the overall, the most important date in history was the, the date when man landed on the moon. I well, think that was the, mo- the biggest turning point in both technology and history for all of mankind. Like minds must think alike because I've asked many people that question on interviews. No one except you has given me that, but I view that to be the most important thing that has ever happened when we lifted off this earth and landed on another spear. That has got to be one of the most important things. Now, some people have told me the invention of teletype or, or, or you know, being able to print stuff out, and most certainly that's important. 
the birth, they've given me the birth of uh, Jesus. They've given me a lot of things. But I, like you, believe that to be one of the most important things. Now, define. Let's go a little deeper into that. What did we get from it? Oh, man, what didn't we get from it? Uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, the, the adventure to the moon, you have to include the entire space technology as a whole. And with very few exceptions, there's very little of what we now have and, and enjoy that did not come from the space as a direct product of the space, uh, the space program. Everything from simple little things like Velcro uh, to the way that we get our entertainment to the way this very interview is being conducted right now. I mean, here I said, I mean, think about this. You and I are, are about in the, in the same generation. Think back to when you were 9 or 10 years old. Try to imagine a world back then from that standpoint of where we were standing around and we were holding telephones in our hand that were smaller than the palms of our hands with no wires attached to it, or that I could speak to you from my living room in Tulsa, Oklahoma, all the way up in Fond du Lac, without using a telephone connection at all, be it a a cellular connection or a landline. I'm talking to you through what's called VoIP, uh, a a line through through the computer. it's everything we have like that came directly from uh, from the technology that was based in, uh, in in our in our space program. The very computers that we have right now are direct descendants of the computers they had aboard the, um, uh, the the spacecraft. And the ironic thing is, the spacecraft that launched Apollo 11, the computer that was on board on that was 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 less powerful than the computer that you have in your smartphone uh, right now. Uh, but, you know, that technology has evolved up to a point that is just absolutely incredible. My microwave oven that sits on my, uh, that sits on my table uh, right now, the, the refinements on that came from the space program, even though the technology of the, uh, of the microwave itself actually rests elsewhere. But the refinements in almost everything that we have now came directly from the space program, where if not for that, much of what we have now would have a completely different look. Well... I I wouldn't have said it any better. You have added things that is food for thought for anyone. Now, I think one of the most important uh, movie producers and directors have been Gene Roddenberry. Um, I, I would have to I would have to admit that. Uh, I, the, you know, he he was such a uh, uh, such a, a landmark producer and a landmark writer. And, and the way you're talking, you, you kind of make me feel like you probably know. Before he was writing Star Trek, he was writing uh, westerns for like Half Gun Will Travel and things like that. And as a matter of fact, it was when Gene Roddenberry was working uh, as a uh, uh, as a, a speech writer for the uh, Los Angeles Police Department. His boss and now uh, uh, Parker, Chief Parker, uh, was who he worked for. He, he was uh, Chief Parker was the uh, chief of police for the uh, LAPD. Uh, for many, many years, and he was well-respected within the Los Angeles area. As a matter of fact, to this day, whenever you watch an episode of Dragnet, uh, a lot of things uh, within that within that television show focus around something called the Parker Center, which at the time was the headquarters for the Los Angeles Police Department, and they were named from Chief Parker. And Gene Roddenberry would write um, uh, his episodes as a moonlighter, and nobody in the police department knew that he actually was a scriptwriter for a lot of TV shows. And when he was uh, patterning one of the characters in Star Trek, he patterned it after uh, Chief, uh, Chief Parker because Chief Parker was this really stoic individual. And the reason why they hired Roddenberry to write speeches for him was since uh, Chief Parker was so stoic and cold-natured and just spoke with pure logic and there was no passion, if it weren't for Gene Roddenberry, nobody would have really cared much for Chief Parker, thinking he was just so impersonal, nobody would like to be around him. But it was Gene Roddenberry that helped Chief Parker discover his inner personality, if you will, and uh, went on to become a, uh, and th- which allowed Parker to go on to become a very successful chief of police. On the other side of that coin, it was Chief Parker's personality that Gene Roddenberry used as the mold for that little pointy-eared guy from space, uh, space who always talked in, in nothing but pure logic, the guy from the planet Vulcan, Mr. Spock himself was inspired by Chief Parker and the result of Gene Roddenberry's uh, exposure to him. Wonderful. I didn't know that at all. I was just going to say, look at my cell phone. It was the communicator. Mm. It it indeed was. The little flip uh, cell phone that we have was actually patterned after uh, uh, Star Trek. The diagnostic uh, uh, beds that you saw in the original sick bay of... uh, 
uh, of Star Trek on the, on, the, on the original series is actually being tested in, uh, in, in several uh, military installations now. So a lot of the technology that they had in Star Trek is uh, slowly becoming a reality, I including, believe it or not, the transporter. Even technology, uh, the technology that would transport a physical item from one place to the next is being toyed with. And as a matter of fact, tr uh, actual transports have been done uh, on a molecular on a molecular. Was it atomic or molecular? I can't remember. It was one of those two, but it was on a very, very small level. But they have, they have indeed uh, been able to transport. And if you'll think about it, our current technology, to a certain extent, works in that, uh, works in that fashion and actually transports data from one place to another, um, like the computers, the, the uh, cell phones, the fax machines, and things like that. Uh, we can actually cross into uh, uh, different time zones, uh, thereby getting some kind of a modified time travel thing going on. And what I mean by that is, I, li like yourself, I'm in the central time zone. If you were to take and send an email or a fax to somebody in California, if you look at the actual times this is going on, they are actually opening up that email or reading that fax three hours before you ever sent it. So, I mean, it opens up all kinds of really neat, really neat discussions of philosophy of time travel and the very idea of transporting data from one place to the next almost seems to be like a second cousin twice removed from the uh, transporters used in Star Trek. His name is W.B. Ward. You listen to him daily on this radio station, whichever one you're listening to. He is here given the same information, the same, the same philosophy that you hear right now is what he creates his, well, his programs on, and even more. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I want to talk to him about Hitler now. Hitler. Hitler. Okay. Now, space travel. And going to the moon, yes, most important. And uh, there's very few people that says I'm an admirer of Hitler. But we have got to give Hitler credit before Hitler. And without Hitler, they might not be a jet in the sky. Well, yeah, you, there, there's a lot of truth to that. Hitler, uh, uh, r regardless of uh, what kind of reputation he and the Nazi party may have left on the world, uh, and granted, uh, it, it, it's hard to look at a, a person such as Adolf Hitler in any kind of pos, uh, positive light at all. But there are a lot of things uh, that we, we can learn uh, from, from looking at an individual such as, uh, such as Hitler. Like, for instance, if anybody is wanting to become a successful public speaker, you would be hard-pressed to find any better example of public speaking than Adolf Hitler. I mean, look at what he was able to accomplish, even though he, when he first went into politics in Germany, he was not accepted very well at all. As a matter of fact, he had to commit fraud in order to get, a, uh, in order to, to get a, a elected to his very first political office. But once he was in and he was delivering his speeches, he was so magnetic, he was so charismatic, people hung on to every single word that he said. And from what you were speaking of and what you were touching on from the technological aspect, not only in, uh, in, in uh, aerospace or you know, in flying uh, and all the uh, tremendous, tremendous accomplishments that he made there, but he made tremendous accomplishments into, uh, I I into rocket science. Um, by recruiting some of the most famous uh, rocket scientists who ever lived, Werner von Braun uh, uh, would be probably one of the most uh, prestigious. Of course, you know, he, he's eventually defected here to the United States and uh, helped become one of the founding members of what we now call NASA. He also was, uh, uh, Hitler was also uh, preeminent in the technology of automotive uh, cars. Uh, and when, when they were trying to come up with the people's car, something affordable for the average person in Germany that they could order, and when you, trans, when you translate people's car into German, you come up with something uh, that translates literally as a Volks car or a Volkswagen. Uh, and that is now what we now call Volkswagen. And that's, that all came from the Hitler regime. I've got to look. At, I've read several books, and I've got to look at him. And I tried to figure him out. I couldn't do it because, in one aspect, it looked like he was just a brilliant leader. In the other, it was looked like he was a pawn. That's the way I kept. I could not figure it out. Yeah, he, he is somewhat of an enigma in in many different ways. Uh, he, in my opinion, and this is just that, uh, even though. Hitler would have to be called a master manipulator of people as a whole. I think as an individual, I think Hitler was easily manipulated himself. 
uh, some of the ideas of which he was later on uh, uh, preaching from from the podiums in front of a uh, large large groups of crowds. He earlier had actually uh, appalled those same the same philosophies. So at some point during his life, um, uh, my thought is you know, that uh, other people had a had a way of getting a hold of him and changing and molding his philosophies and and feelings into what uh, we became what became known as Nazi Germany. W. B. Ward is his name. And you listen to him every day when he comes on and says, Get, tell me what you say every morning. How do you open this up? Uh, well, with my simple, uh, my, my simple little opening music, and I just simply say, uh, this is Ward's Daily Almanac. I'm W.B. Ward. Today is whatever day of the week it is. And today, I uh, give a little teaser as to the end story. It's, it's a really quite sim- it's quite a simple show. Uh, and, and, and you can find out about birthdays. Disasters, and that's what I want to talk about right now. Disasters. Okay. Well, nine eleven. Oh man, where were you? I at, at the time I was working for about seven radio stations here in Tulsa. Um, I, when the uh, when the actual attack began, uh, I was um, at home asleep, and a friend of mine had called me and asked me if I had the news turned on, and, and I turned on um, immediately to NBC. And the very first thing that I was within about five minutes of me turning it on is when I, I witnessed the uh, second uh, jet flying into the World Trade Center. Just like everybody else, the second that you saw that second plane hit the tower, you knew this was not an accident. We were officially at war. And as soon as I thought that to myself, my phone rang telling me, get up to the, uh, get up to the studio immediately. Um, uh, among the stations that I worked for, one was a news station. The others were all music stations. But regardless of the format, everybody was covering that story from uh, solid for the next 48 uh, to 72 hours. And I was I was no different. Just like anybody else in the media, I was living at work from that point on. Right, right. ABC, that's who we were affiliated and still are. But they're not called ABC anymore. But they... Uh, we just put the coverage on there and left it. Do you think that anything has ever happened like that in history that so gripped a world? Uh, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, I, in, in all due respect uh, to the to the victims of 9/11, I certainly don't mean to you know take any anything away from from that. But certainly, the attack on Pearl Harbor would have to have been the equivalent of that. Certainly, we didn't have anywhere near the loss of life, loss of civilian life, as we did on September 11th and uh, 20, 2001. But uh, still, I mean, that was such a, an attack on a, on a massive basis that, at least from the point of perspective, they would have to be equal in in, in the shock value. I've interviewed people that were at Pearl Harbor in the service, mm-hmm. and they say it was just confusion. Just much like New York, just a state of confusion. We, But the amazing thing about America and probably the world and maybe humanity is that we bounce back, but we don't forget. Yeah, this is true. And, you know, uh, when you said that, it, it, it made me remember something. Because as far as the confusion was concerned between September 11th of 2001 and also on December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, as you mentioned, there was nothing but confusion, and that was a great commonality. But what's interesting is what caused that confusion was the exact same thing, and that was lack of communication. In spite of our technology, in spite of how uh, we have become so called advanced over all these years, in spite of all the satellites, in spite of all the cell phones, we still had almost a virtual communications blackout. And this is one thing that does kind of worry, uh, worry me now, present day, as a society. Uh, we, the reason why, uh, because we, the reason why it worries me, let me back up, I was starting to get ahead of myself, is the fact that our technological system, although it is, it is advanced, although it is very sophisticated and it's something definitely worth writing home to mother about, there's virtually no kind of a safety net involved for the, for the event of a, of a catastrophe. September 11th would be a classic example of that. No, we, we had absolutely no safety net for the technology of communication. And because of that, because of the extent of the damage and how many people were involved, every single cell phone tower was being tied up, and all of a sudden nobody had a way of contacting anybody. 
Um, and that was pretty much what caused the confusion and, and, and things back in 1941 at Pearl Harbor. Of course, they didn't have the technology to begin with, but in both cases, nobody had any way to communicate anything with anybody else at any time to, you know, concerning the attack or what to do about it. Global warming. What does W.B. Ward have to say about global warming? <laughs> wow, you talk, well, you're handing me a hot potato this morning. Okay. My, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if you hear me coughing to this interview, please forgive me. I, I do not have the flu, I do, so you're not going to catch anything from me. This is a side effect of some medications that I have to take. Um, global warming. I believe in global warming, and I know I just lost probably a lot of credibility with a large part of the audience. I believe global warming is a, is a very real thing, and I believe it is happening. Now, what is also equally important to that is what I don't believe. I don't believe we had a doggone thing to do with it. I, I think global warming is a, is, a natural, uh, is a natural cycle that happens uh, to the globe uh, over, a, over a period of time. And as, a, as one offering of uh, evidence toward that, I, would, I always ask people, if global warming is just happening now uh, for the very first time, then what brought the Ice Age to an end? Uh, and so far, I have yet of any of my um, uh, of any of my scientist friends to ever give me any kind of a, a of a quantitative answer to that because it's just like, well, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, no, I, I believe that's a natural occurrence. I don't think man had really that much to do with it, and the, and the Earth is actually going to warm up by itself, and eventually we'll cool down again. Do you know who Steve Goddard is? Goddard's gold. He was rings a bell. Out of Tulsa, we we play uh, uh, we play his. Um, Yes, yes, I know who you're talking about now. Yes, I do. Yeah, I, I know who he is. He, we play him two hours, uh, no, maybe three hours on uh, on Saturday mornings. He's out of Tulsa. I got to interview him once. Uh, you know, you're living in a hot bed of radio out there, aren't you? Oh, you better believe it. Is it still as important and vi- and full of life as it always has been, or has 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 the new communications taken over? Uh, reg- regrettably, no. It is it is not as lively as it once was here in radio. I mean, we, we have uh, tons and tons of radio stations, uh, but very few companies. Uh, because, as you know, most of most of the uh, radio stations are now being absorbed through large corporate companies. Uh, the the vast majority of all of our stations here are owned by primarily two uh, two major corporations. Both of them begin with the letter C, and I'll just let the rest of the, the audience here use their own imagination to uh-huh. what companies I'm talking about. Uh, any, anything outside of that, you're looking into the smaller uh, corporation chains, but most everything here is owned by the large corporations. And, man, i got to tell you, uh, speaking as a, a 35-year broadcaster myself, I really miss the days of when uh, uh, broadcasting uh, was, was regulated and you know, was owned uh, for virtually all Radio stations were mom and pop shops. I, I just love that. I think that's the way, ra- way the way radio was intended to be. Uh, it, it, you really missed on a lot of hands-on and a lot of fun programming uh, by doing it that way. Um, but unfortunately, it, it is it has become a little bit condensed, in, uh, a little bit less condensed in that in that remark uh, here locally. I am, however, very proud to say, and you, you were talking about back in the uh, the heyday of radio. I went to uh, one of the uh, not the first one, but one of the first stations I ever worked at was w- one of the stations that Paul Harvey started at. As a, as a matter of fact, the high school that I went to was the same high school Par- Paul Harvey went to, and uh, Paul Harvey was among the graduating class with my mom, who was also in attendance of that same school. Um, he, so Paul Harvey went to my junior high, he went to my high school, and he and I both worked at the, uh, the, at the same radio station, and I also had done some work at a television, local television station that Paul Harvey worked for uh, for a while as well. Now, if I could only manage to duplicate his income, I'd be a happy camper. Well, did is that what influenced you to do what WB Ward does? Um, no, actually, um, well, he, he certainly he certainly was a major influence. Yeah, uh, I've heard people draw some kind of uh, parallel between Ward's Daily Almanac and Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story. I, I got to tell you, I don't really see the comparison between the two. I, I really don't. I feel flattered as can be that some people make that uh, make that comparison. Uh, personally, I, I just don't see that since I since I cover um, so many different events in one in one broadcast, and the rest of the story only covered one. Um, 
so you know, there is a major, major difference there in formatting. But I do appreciate the uh, the comparison. But still, Paul Harvey and his ability to tell stories certainly has had an influence on both the way that I write and the way that I communicate over the air. Um, but the biggest thing that got me into broadcasting to begin with is the fact that I am a uh, uh, agoraphobic is what it's called. Um, for those who don't know what agoraphobia is, if you know what claustrophobia is, you know, the fear of being in, you know, like a closet or something like that, I'm the exact opposite of that. I don't like, I, 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 uh, I don't like being in crowds, and I don't like being in large open spaces, and both of them just really, really make me nervous. And so I became a performer to help me deal with the, <laughs> with the agoraphobia. And I know that doesn't sound, at first, at first glance, it doesn't sound like that that gels as a possible... Um, uh, response to uh, something like agoraphobia, but if you're performing, or I was using radio as an example, even though, yes, we're in front of you know, a large number of people at any given time, sometimes tens of thousands of people, sometimes millions, uh, but it doesn't get away from the fact that there for 35 years I made my living sitting in a room that was, was a virtually a very large uh, broom closet talking to myself. That's, so I was completely apart from the crowd. And whenever I'm uh, doing a, a public speaking engagement or if I'm performing somewhere, still, even though there's a large n a number of people there, um, I've performed for crowds as small as 50. I, I, and the largest crowd I was ever in front of was estimated to be, I think it was like 60,000 or something like that. Even though that there are a l very large amount of people there, you're not in the crowd. You are not in that crowd. You are in front of that crowd. Uh, and so you are separate and apart from it. So that provides a nice little uh, mental barrier, if, if you will, uh, between uh, the crowd and somebody who, like myself, suffers from something like agoraphobia. So actually, I'm, I'm quite at home in what I do. You're getting ready to, uh, you're attempting to do something. And and you you are in need of some help here in doing what you're going to do. I would like for you to detail that to our listening audience. And thank you, thank you very much uh, for asking that. Yeah, I've, I've started a campaign on a website called Kickstarter. Um, and first off, as to what Kickstarter is. I, I recently found, uh, within the last six months, I discovered Kickstarter, and I thought, man, this is just really fantastic. It's a safe place where you can go uh, if you want to see what people are doing and they're making, I don't know, they, they may make a better uh, 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 flower pot or, or they're writing a book or, or they're, writing, they're making a movie or something like this, and they explain what their project is. And they, they set a goal of a certain amount of money, and they ask people for, uh, uh, for pledges. A, a, a certain amount of money, and this is a safe way for those people to fund uh, projects that they feel are worthy of funding. Now, in my particular case, it's a book series of Ward's Daily Almanac. It's taking uh, everything that I've been doing since 2001 with Ward's Daily Almanac, and it's putting it all into book form, uh, doing some cross-reference uh, research, uh, taking out all the errors, because uh, any, any history book that's a history book at all has errors in it. I'm sorry to say, but yes, folks, that is true. Uh, they make it in there sometimes, but it is it, it, but few and far between, I'll, I'll add very quickly. Uh, but the research is being done. So far, I have actually written 10 books uh, that, that are out there now. Um, I'm on book number 11. Now, the entire series itself will be a total of 13 books. The first 12 books... Uh, will be books that are dedicated to one month of the year. You have the book of January, the book of February, the book of March, the book of April, and so on and so forth. Each chapter in each book is dedicated to that specific day on that specific year. In the book of February, for instance, the second chapter would be about February 2nd. Incidentally, in, uh, since I'm brought up February, we do have 29 chapters in that because I even allow for, uh, uh, for leap year. Uh, now, by the time the series is done, we'll have 12 books, one for each day of the year, uh, leading up through December. I'm almost through with that. I'm on book number 11. I'm on the book of November right now. The 13th book is going to be a giant anthology book that's going to contain the best of the best from the previous 12 editions. Uh, 12 editions. Uh, it, it's going to be a recap, and, and a, it's going to be greatly illustrated. Uh, all the books are illustrated, but the uh, anthology book itself is going to be illustrated a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more photographs. We have, we actually have photographs and illustrations of things like the original patent drawings. I, I about turned somersaults when I found the original patent drawing that the Wright brothers uh, submitted for their airplane, and I, I, I thought that was the most uh, amazing thing I ever saw. I have another photograph too. It's a very rare photograph that you can find of Hoover Dam, um, and what makes this photograph really unique was that 
dam had just been uh, had just been installed, and this photograph is taken from the upstream side when the lake is still empty, and you can see the dam from top to bottom on the side of the lake that you can only see the top few feet of nowadays. Uh, so these are the kind of pictures that I'm putting in here. Now, what's funny about the anthology book, and I haven't released this information anywhere else. This is the first time I've ever mentioned this, but I've already, I've already got the title of the book, uh, the title of the book reserved, because a friend of mine was, uh, we, we were discussing possible titles for the anthology book. Since the book of uh, February, book of March, and things like that, that, all that was taken, I didn't want to call it the book of the almanac because that would just kind of be boring. And he suggested one thing. He suggested, he, he mentioned to me, he said, Bill, usually when I, when I have uh, your book, usually I'm, well, answering, well, nature's call, uh, to, put it, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. And that, he said, that's usually where I read it. And I thought, okay, well, that's something to go on. So this whole book, of an, <laughs> the anthology book, is going to be promoted as a great reference book for the bathroom, and it's going to be appropriately titled The Book of John. <laughs> I love it. So <laughs> we're having fun with this. But, you know, the campaign that, that you're talking about is primarily to assist me in, in, in two things. First off, I lead what is probably one of the busiest lives that I know about. I, I get up every morning uh, at 3 a.m. Um, I, I produce uh, two or three episodes of the, uh, of the radio version of Ward's Daily Almanac. I sit there and I write for about an hour. For, uh, the, the book of series uh, in my continuing research and then from there I will go on and do my uh, daily maintenance of, uh, uh, of you know just running the small company itself because I'm strictly a one person operation this is one person doing the entire thing and that is yours truly and I've been doing this like I said for the last 12 years and then after I finish doing that I go on to an eight hour uh, no right now I'm working a 10 hour a day job uh, so I've been doing all of this by myself while also juggling a career on top of that so if I'm able to reach my goal of $100,000 on this Kickstarter campaign that I have, this is going to enable me to finish the book project out and then start the undaunting task of actually promoting the book itself. Everybody, uh, anybody who's ever been in business knows that the big, big expense you're going to have once you have a product or service that is available is promoting that product or service, marketing it properly, and getting it out there to the places that it needs to be. That goal of $100,000 is going to help us to do that. And you can, if you feel that my project is one that is worthy of that kind of attention, please go to my website at wbward.com. If you scroll down about halfway, you'll see the word Kickstarter. If you click on that, that will take you to the page that describes the whole thing. And on there I have a video uh, that explains the project. And my apologies in advance. It's my face in the video. And you'll see that there truly is a reason why I'm in radio and not on television. <laughs> but you, you watch that video, and it will explain to you the project itself and also let you know about some of the rewards that are being given uh, for people uh, for people who do make a pledge to this. So this is not an investment. There is no return on your money. Um, and so it's not a loan or anything like this. It's just so how you can help people like myself who have a project that you think is worthy of attention. Uh, and, you, and you can pledge any amount you want from a dollar. Uh, if, by golly, if anybody feels so inclined and they've got the they've got the clams to do it, and they want to go ahead and pledge a hundred thousand dollars, be my guest. Uh, <laughs> on different levels of uh, different pledges, though, you do qualify to receive uh, uh, certain rewards. So, regardless as to the size of the pledge, there is in fact something in it for anybody who does make a pledge. Uh, we don't uh, just simply take your money and say thank you very much, have a nice life. You do get something back for it. Um, like for instance, for a pledge of a dollar or more. You put on my, you're, you're automatically put on my uh, almanac uh, email list, and every day of the week you receive the almanac for that particular day. I've been doing that since 2001. That's how the almanac got started itself. Um, any pledge of $50 or more receives a, a free autographed copy of the book of your choice, a certificate of things, and, of course, the email subscription. To anybody who uh, pledges $975 or more gets all of that, plus the entire 12-book collection, uh, uh, along with a certificate of thanks and an email subscription. And, of course, the granddaddy of all, uh, anybody who would pledge $2,000 or more gets the whole ball of wax, gets the whole 12 books, they get the anthology book, the Book of John. Plus, it, within the anthology book, those, those people will be listed by name in a special section called Special Contributors, so they'll actually be listed in the book uh, themselves. So, you know, there, there is something in it for you if somebody does, you know, make a pledge on it. Man, I'll tell you what, this has been... A, uh, a lifelong dream for me to do. I have to admit, 
I've bitten off a lot here, and it's not more than I can chew. It's just that it takes, with my current schedule, it takes forever for me to produce uh, produce the books. Right now, with my schedule, I can only produce maybe a, a chapter a week. I would like to be uh, begin producing two chapters a day. If I'm able to complete this uh, goal and reach 100,000, uh, I will, in fact, be able to do just that. Uh, go ahead and get it promoted, get the book series finished, and then work on the promotions and work on the marketing and get this series in every school library, every public library, and, and in as many bookstores as uh, humanly possible from coast to coast. Tell them how they can get one of these CDs. Well, by going to that same website, uh, wbward.com, uh, at, near the middle, at the top, you'll see a, a section called WBCDs or something to that effect. Uh, and that will list all the CDs that I recorded. Incidentally, with the exception of the guitar CD, all of the uh, all of the piano CDs uh, that are on there were recorded uh, uh, within a time span of about three months. Uh, when I suffered a I, I suffered two strokes in the last uh, few years, and after my second stroke, I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, so I just set up the the studio. I already have my studio set up, of course, for the uh, radio program. Um, but I just uh, I started plugging in the instruments and things like that, and I had some help uh, from, from some friends on the technological end getting everything together. So as uh, occupational therapy, I just began recording. Next thing I know, I now have, what, five or six CDs, something like that. So everything you're hearing there was as a result of me uh, recuperating at home after a stroke. W.B. Ward, wbward.com, Ward's Daily Almanac. You hear it on this station. Now you got a meeting. And if you go to that website... You click on it, you'll find out he's a musician, a writer, not just another pretty face. <laughs> well, that's the truth. <laughs> well, you know, by gosh, 46 minutes have already come and gone. Man. But it's been fun, been educational, and now don't, but don't be a stranger. We'll have to get on here and do this again. I, I get to interview some of the great people in, in entertainment. It's uh, from Dale Robertson. He's from Oklahoma. And he just passed away in February. Uh, boy, now, he was real. Dale Robertson was real. That's the only way that I can describe him. I've never had the pleasure of meeting him, but I've heard that time and time again. Uh, don't be a stranger. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have you back on real soon. Bless your heart, sir. Thank you so much. Well, for impale me. some wisdom upon us as uh, we float out of here, because I'm going to... Put one of your stuff, well, the variations in the canon as if we say goodbye. So let's hear something. Be very careful in the history that you create today, for today's present is tomorrow's history. Any impact you have on somebody today will affect somebody tomorrow. Thanks a bunch. See you, Bill.